Nigel, from your magnificent trophy room, this is just one of your superb collection of trophies commemorating your 30 Grand Prix wins. Now, we're going to see them all, but we're going to talk about 11 of them. How have you been able to choose just 11 out of so many? I think with the greatest of difficulty, but, uh, you know, uh, we have to slim them down, and I'll pick what I believe is the top 11 races that we won, and uh, it starts off, uh, needless to say, in 1985 at Brands Hatch where we won our first race, and uh, that was obviously a very special one. The win at Brands Hatch was preceded by four seasons of Grand Prix racing with Team Lotus, where Nigel's talent had first come to the notice of the late Colin Chapman. I'm absolutely certain that you're looking at a potential world champion, and I don't think it'll be very long before uh, we'll see Nigel consistently winning races. Nigel, all your wins were concentrated into the period 1985 to 1992, but you actually started in Grand Prix racing in 1980. Why did it take you so long to win? I mean, I think that's a very good question. Uh, basically, you have to get yourself in the right place at the right time. The time seemed to have arrived in 1984. The place, Monaco, in torrential rain. There is the new leader. Nigel Mansell leads on lap 12. This is the first time that Nigel Mansell has ever led a Grand Prix. Driving in his 49th Grand Prix, Nigel was heading for his first victory when fate and the elements took over. Nigel Mansell now very coolly dealing with things. He is no new boy, but it's a new experience for him to know that he's leading a Grand Prix. Cross goes through, he's injured and rumbling. He has now lapped. Jack and off goes Nigel Mansell. I spoke too soon. Mansell lost it in the biggest possible way. That was the race leader. There's white paint on the road. And uh, I, I put my car maybe three inches to uh, the right, a little bit too much going up the hill. And in fifth gear, uh, under power, I just touched one of these white paints and I immediately got wheel spin and he just flicked the car sideways into the armco. Sometimes you, you don't even have a chance of um, having the opportunity to even try and think about winning a race because you're in a team which just isn't competitive. You're basically making the numbers up. And I think that'd be true to say that uh, when Colin Chapman innovated the ground effect car and then came into the 80s, he was innovating double chassis cars, which were obviously banned at a later stage. And the cars were just not competitive then. Um, so it took a number of years to get the right seat to get the job done, and obviously I got that done uh, two years after Colin uh, passed away, which was with the Williams team. Nigel's move to Williams paired him with 1982 world champion Keke Rosberg and revitalised his career. Towards the end of the 1985 season, Mansell was again ready to challenge for that elusive first win. That first win was in the 14th race of the year, the European Grand Prix at Brands yeah. Hatch. Why was it the European and not the British Grand Prix? I'm not quite sure. I think uh, mainly because there'd already been a British Grand Prix and there was one race that fell by the wayside and, and the backup race for that year was Brands Hatch, so they had to call it the European Grand Prix as opposed to the British Grand Prix. But for me, it was basically another British Grand Prix because it was in my home country. Did you think by then that you were ever going to win? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's just a question of time, you see. As I've always said to you, especially on and off the camera over the years, as long as you're honest with yourself, um, you really know what the truth of the situation is. And, you know, you have a lot of people saying, oh, give me the right car, they'll win. Well, some will, and a lot of them will never win. Uh, I always knew that given the right opportunity, we could, we could uh, do the job. And, you know, I think the nice thing about this conversation now is that uh, at least I can say, well, you know, we did prove a point. One and a half litre turbocharged engine, and it was not an easy car to drive. Well, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, 1,300, 1,400 horsepower in qualifying. Uh, in race trim, we had about 900 horsepower. I mean, sometimes it was even in excess of 900 horsepower. I mean, no, in one word, I mean, the cars were difficult, but uh, very exciting to drive. I mean, uh, I loved it that the fact I went through this era with, uh, with the turbochargers. Senna's 
Lotus led away from the start. Nigel attacked, going into Paddock Bend. Before running wide at Druids and falling back to fourth place behind Piquet. A few laps later, Luck was on Mansell's side when Rosberg tried to pass Senna for the lead. And off spins Rosberg, and into him goes Nelson Piquet. On this, the seventh lap, Rosberg trying to take Senna goes off. Is it fair to say, Nigel, that you actually got a lot of help from Keke Rosberg after he'd had to come in and make a tar stop and rejoined in front of Ayrton Senna? Um, Keke, I'd say in general, not, not just that particular race, but I'd say Keke was one of the best teammates I've ever had in my career. Well, look at this! A terrific scrap for the leader. There's a change because the Williams has gone past Ayrton Senna, who has therefore lost the lead, and he has lost it to Nigel Mansell. Keke is a thoroughbred racer. Um, he doesn't uh, suffer fools easily, and nor do I. Um, and, uh, you know, he calls a spade a spade, so, I mean, Keke, uh, I've got utmost respect for. I think he is a brilliant driver and probably still is, um, and that's why we got on so well. Well, you led from lap nine to the end. At last you were going to do it for the first time, but your team didn't actually show you your position as you were going by on the last three laps at all. No, I know. I don't know why they were doing that. I mean, perhaps they were worried I'd get too excited and perhaps fall off or something. But, uh, you know, I mean, teams do uh, miscount the race laps occasionally. And sometimes they think they're doing you a favour by doing weird and wonderful things. But it didn't matter to me because I knew exactly where we were. There must have been enormous pressure on you. Were you thinking, one more lap and I'm going to win my first Grand Prix? It was more relief rather than pressure, it was relief that, you know, now we've actually achieved it. I mean, you set yourself goals, and those goals sometimes come later rather than sooner, and as long as you don't lose your objective and you lose the sight of what you are trying to achieve, then it will come, but sometimes it does take more time than you think. And now he comes out of clearways and takes the chequered flag, and Nigel Mansell has won the Shell Oils Grand Prix of Europe. He is exultant, he is exuberant, and he's got every justification to be. It was the first time a British driver had won a Grand Prix for 43 races. John Watson had won at Long Beach in 1983. And after all that, I think I'm right in saying that someone dropped your Shell Oil's cut glass bowl. <laughs> yeah, smashed it. Yeah, you're quite right, but I wouldn't incriminate who it was. <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm afraid we had to get a replica made because uh, it was smashed to smithereens. And that's the one in your trophy cupboard. Yeah, but the replica is... Uh, is exactly the same. You know, they always say that the first Grand Prix is the most difficult to win. Well, you won that one and you went on to win the next one in South Africa, where there were terrific political problems. Yes, I mean, 1985 was very difficult, obviously, in South Africa, and, you know, a lot of things were also changing in Formula One at that time, too. And it's go. Beautiful start by Mansell. Rosberg is ahead of PK. Dust flying up, and now it's Nigel Mansell leading. PK coming up into second position. Sura into third place. The Williams Hondas were beginning to dominate in Formula One. Nigel's only serious opposition that day would come from his teammate. Look at the two Williams cars together with Rosberg challenging for the lead on lap eight. Rosberg going through and taking Nigel Mansell. He and I were trading off fastest laps and then we came down the long, long straight and someone had blown up just in front of us and uh, Keke went spinning off in front of me. I mean, we Great both locked up. Us. Yeah, we both locked up going into the corner and. I just got round the corner, scrabbled round, and uh, Keki was able to keep going and reju rejoin behind me. And it was a great, great race from there on in. Three laps to go at the end of this one, which Rosberg is just approaching. The gap was nine seconds. It's now just over uh, seven. Rosberg's tremendous late race charge would be in vain. And Mansell coming up to the line. 
to win his second Grand Prix in succession in superb style. After a five-year wait for his first victory, Nigel's second win had followed just two weeks later. Uh, with those two wins under your belt, into 1986, and you were starting with a new teammate, Nelson Piquet. How did you feel about him? Um, indifferently. But, I mean, uh, all I was interested in, because I just started to win, was concentrating on my personal job in hand. And, uh, you know, Nelson was al already joining as a world champion, so, uh, you know, Keki was leaving as a world champion as such, so uh, it made no difference to me, really. What was the situation? Did they say you're, you're equal drivers, Nelson is number one, you're number two? I mean, Well, I think what I'd rather do is say to you that a lot of the problems was caused then between Nelson and I by uh, the fact of what the team promised Nelson. And because he didn't get what he felt he was promised, he took it out on me. Um, it's well catalogued, so this is not just me saying yeah, it, yeah. that, you know, Nelson was promised totally uh, outright number one driver status. He felt he wasn't given it. He was promised an awful lot of things by Frank Williams. Uh, he definitely said at many times that he wasn't given what he said uh, was uh, supposed to be there. And so it made him extremely unhappy. And needless to say, because I was, if you like, the person in the, in the team, in the car, winning the races when he wasn't. And even when he was finishing, I was beating him sometimes. Needless to say, we didn't have a very good relationship. Despite the winning capability shown at the end of 1985, the early races of 1986 proved unsuccessful for Nigel. It was not until the fifth Grand Prix of that year in Belgium that Mansell added to his score. And it's go! And out comes Keki Rosberg to the right. PK leads. Ross is coming up. Berger goes through in second position, but already Senna is up into second place. And what a jam! Because Berger has spun. Teo Fabi stops. One of the McLaren stops. And past me goes Senna, who's in second place. Third is Mansell. The Honda engine sounding really crisp, but Nigel Mansell is taking Senna. There you see Mansell second, Senna third, Johansson fourth. And that's Nelson Piquet in the pits and out of the car. The race leader has retired. A tremendous tyre change by the Williams mechanics helped Nigel to take first place. And although Senna fought back, at the finish it was Red 5 that took the chequered flag. He's going to win, absolutely no doubt about it. Nigel Mansell wins the Belgian Grand Prix. Out go the Union Jacks from the Williams pit. So a magnificent third victory for Nigel Mansell. Now, your third best win selection was the Canadian Grand Prix of 1986. What do you remember about that? Canadian circuit, I remember that race in particular because it was a great win there because we had a fantastic race uh, with Keke. Uh, uh, also, uh, you know, between the McLaren was and, McLaren, that's then. right, yes. and myself, and uh, it was a super race from the point of view. We had to manage the car more, so we had to turn the boost down and slow down because of the fuel economy. And it's go, and a superb start by Mansell. He really gave it the gun. Mansell leads, Senna second. PK has been taken already by Prost from fourth position, so it's the Williams leading, the Lotus second. Nigel opened a six second lead in the early laps, but when it became necessary to conserve fuel, Rosberg's McLaren came up to challenge. They go through, there's Rosberg, the lead changes, and on lap 17, Keke Rosberg moves into the lead. Something that always mystifies me about a top driver like you is that you can drive at ten tenths and, and still think tactically. How do you do that? I think, I think basically part of it is um, your natural talent. And the other part is being in total control of what you're doing, having time to do other things. If you're doing your job to the best of your ability, uh, you tend to have other time, other spare time to use. And, and therefore, when you're driving very, very well and everything's working, you can think about all sorts of things and be prepared. 
and if you like you can pre-program your mind for the race and all sorts of different things so if eventuality happens you've got it covered and you're automatically doing what you think you should have done your thinking your tactics your strategy worked because you actually used Alan Jones to get back into the lead oh sure yeah. how well instinctively I mean when you come up on a back marker or uh, a slower car um, Alan was having problems and we were coming up to overtake him and he was sliding wide. Keki went momentarily uh, behind him to get the slipstream. I'd already got the jump on Keki out the corner and I basically blocked him in behind Alan and just went straight through it. It would prove to be the decisive moment of the race. Almost home now, Nigel Mansour comes down to the pit's hairpin for the last time to win after a superbly dominant drive and takes the chequered flag. Just look at him, shaking his arm in euphoric delight. Great stuff. Mansell's fifth Grand Prix win came in France at the newly shortened Paul Ricard circuit. And Michele Alvaretto is left on the grid as Senna and now Mansell into the lead for the first right-hander. This is going to be the most difficult corner of the race. All round safely so far. Alvaretto is being pushed away and has got his car started and getting away last. And Nigel Mansell has made an absolutely superb start. The Williams team's tactic of making two planned tyre changes paid off when Nigel was able to catch and pass Prost McLaren late in the race to take a well-deserved victory. He's in a beautiful position to pass Prost, and he does it. Nigel Mansell from the Isle of Man, from Port Erin, is back in the leadership of the French Grand Prix on his way at the moment to his fifth victory in his career. And uh, that will mean that uh, Prost now leads the championship by one point from Nigel Mansell. And a great win for Mansell. Your first choice was the European Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. You were back at Brands Hatch the next year, 1986, again in a Williams Honda. Uh, but this time it was the British Grand Prix, your first British Grand Prix victory. Brands Hatch is no longer used as a Grand Prix circuit. Does that sadden you? Well, I mean, yes it does, but I mean, you know, times change and things change. Um, what you have to appreciate is that Silverstone spends an, an enormous amount of money in the investment of a new circuit, and they have to then reap the rewards of doing that. I think if Brands Hatch was to do something similar, they might possibly get the British Grand Prix back there. But uh, I've got certainly some fantastic memories of Brands Hatch. Well, I've got fantastic memories of that race. You started second on the grid to Nelson Piquet. You blasted off. Your transmission broke at the first corner. You were lucky in a way because the race was stopped because... Uh, the Jacques Lafitte's accident. That's right, because Jacques Lafitte went into the arm car. So you had to get out of your car into Piquet's car which then had to be set up for you. Were they able to make all the changes that were needed? Um, some of them, but not all of them. I mean, I remember that the seat belts were you know, a little bit tight for, for what I liked, and uh, the other problem was there wasn't a drink bottle in the car either. So, uh, you know, there's a few little changes, and the car had more understeer than I had liked uh, with my race car, but I was just grateful that we could get out in the spare car. When the lights blinked to green for the second time, Nigel made a cautious start. And Mansell, obviously getting the hang of things, is closing the gap between himself and Berger's BMW powered Benetton, going for second position, and Mansell is through, up into second place on lap three, to the vast delight of the crowd. 20 laps later, Mansell closed in on Piquet. And there he goes, lap 23, Nigel Mansell leads the British Grand Prix and I emphasise that he is leading the British Grand Prix in a car in which until he started it on the second start was strange to him. I remember so vividly, you came in to make your tyre change, you left the pit lane and rejoined the circuit just as Nelson Piquet was entering the straight 
and then you had this fantastic scrap together with you staying ahead while you warmed up your tyres. And Mansell goes out of the pit lane as PK comes up to it. And Mansell still leads. PK's changed tyres. There he is. PK going round clearways and he sees his teammate in front of him and the order is one, two, and they both change tyres. Yes, very important that for Nigel now because he's on cold tyres, so he won't want to give it. Uh, he's got to feel his way around, so he's going to try and defend position with PK, but PK, no, he held him back, and Nigel slammed the door there, and all the time he's doing that, the tyres are getting hotter. It was phenomenal. Nelson was trying to come on the outside, then the inside, and I just knew that if I could fend him off for another half a lap, then uh, my tyres would be up to temperature, and then he wouldn't be able to live with me. And uh, Nigel Mantle's finding Tyrrell cars getting in the way, had a bit of trouble getting past Streff. Now he's diving through on the inside of Martin Brundle, and PK does the same thing and nearly came right up alongside Nigel Mantle. That was virtually, and PK's in a good position to go for the lead now as they come down to clearways. He's close enough almost to come out from behind Nigel Mantle and go for the lead by turning up the boost a bit. But he won't do it now. You know, that race, I'd say Nelson made one mistake. He missed one gear, which allowed me to uh, overtake him. And uh, that was the only mistake he made. And fortunately, I didn't miss any gears, and we won the race. Yeah. Mansell exits the last corner, crosses the line, and Mansell is the winner. Great stuff. Wonderful drive. A magnificent drive in the spare car. At the end of the race, having won it, you now led the world championship after nine of the 16 races. Was, 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 was your teammate peeved about that, fed up about it, angry about it? Well, I think he was everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and I have to admit to him, uh, you know, after all these years looking back, that probably for his own reasons and by what I understand that he was promised, he probably had good cause to be as well. But, uh, you know, obviously I wasn't aware of all that situation. I was paid to do my job and, you know, I was trying to win as much as I could for myself. The 14th round of the 1986 championship at Estoril was dominated by Mansell. Nigel leading from the green light to the chequered flag to take the seventh win of his career. When he stopped for tyres on the 33rd lap, Mansell was so far ahead of the others that he rejoined the race with an eight and a half second lead. Off goes PK. Now that's blown it. That's really blown it. And you may well have seen Nelson PK there losing all chance of winning the world championship. And Mansell takes the checkered flag. Yes, Nigel Mansell overjoyed with every conceivable reason. You went on, Nigel, to a seventh Grand Prix victory in Portugal, but then on to Australia, where there was a very sad result. Yes, it was an incredibly hard blow because there it was gone. We, I think we only had about 17 laps to go. And uh, I think the most awful experience was I was sitting there in total control with over 40 seconds or more in the lead from the fourth guy, which was Stephanie Hansen. And um, just taking it easy, really. And I was less than two seconds behind Prost. And then uh, we were slipstreaming Ali up down the straight. And I remember getting about another two or three hundred revs in the slipstream and then the tyre just let go and exploded. And then self-preservation obviously set in. Uh, and, uh, you know, the incredible thing was then at the end of the year when I went to the FISA Awards, the uh, clerk of the course said, do you realise what would have happened if you'd have hit the wall? And I said, well, probably yeah, I would have hurt myself or broke my leg. And he said, well, he said, if you'd have hit the wall, it would have been a big accident, which I agreed. He said, but then you'd have bounced back in the circuit and we would have had to stop the race. And I said, well, yeah. He said, do you appreciate what would have happened if we would have stopped the race? And I said, well, no, not really. He said, well, it had gone over three quarters distance. I would have been world champion. So it was that close, even with having the accident, the tire blowing, it was that close from us losing the world championship that year. And I mean, even now being the 1992 world champion uh, of this year, it doesn't really uh, make up for what happened in 86. Recovered from the disappointment in Adelaide, Nigel was ready to fight for the championship again in 1987.
the rivalry between Williams teammates Mansell and Piquet was greater than ever. At the second round of the 1987 championship at Imola, Nelson Piquet was ruled out of the race after a big accident in qualifying. Nigel made the most of his rival's absence. So this is where Mansell will be looking to do it. And uh, Nigel may well have hit his boots button there, and through he goes to take the lead. Despite an earlier than planned tyre change due to a lost wheel balance weight, Nigel's progress to his eighth career win was unstoppable. He comes now down into the Varianta Bassa, into the Truglado. He can see the chequered flag. Nigel Mansell, Williams Honda, crosses the line. The 1987 French Grand Prix was a tense battle of nerves between the Williams drivers. Mansell leads, Cross is second, PK is third, Senna is fourth, so PK has already passed Senna, and there you see Nelson PK nearly off. Mansell's tyre stop dropped him to third, but within two laps he'd passed Prost and was closing on PK. of driving with your brain as well as your feet and through goes Nigel Mansell PK tries to hold him back lovely bit of driving Nigel Mansell takes the lead on the 46th lap PK stopped for tyres hoping to gain advantage from fresh rubber but the plan was upset when the Brazilian stalled his engine in the pits 32 year old Nigel Mansell from Port Erin in the Isle of Man waves his fist wins the French Grand Prix for the second year in succession. Your next choice, the British Grand Prix at Silverstone in 1987. Another fantastic battle with Nelson Piquet. Well, this one was even more precious, I think, because um, the first set of tyres I blistered really badly and I had an incredible vibration from the rear of the car and I had to make a pit stop and uh, I dropped 25 or 26 seconds uh, with only 22 laps to go and I had to make up then second and a half a lap to the end of the race just to be on equal terms with Nelson and uh, needless to say I think uh, I broke the track record 11 times out of the last 19 laps and uh, we we're literally like a freight train going through I mean you know flat out everywhere and then of course uh, the incredible thing was I'd already planned when I caught Nelson, I knew he would do me no favours at all for letting me overtake. We set him up and dummied him going down Hangar Strait and then at 200 miles an hour we, uh, we touched going into Stowe. And uh, needless to say I won the race and the incredible thing for everybody to actually appreciate and realise, I had the turbo turned up so much that uh, the last lap I was out of fuel uh, on the actual dashboard, I had no fuel, I was minus. And I said to myself, well, if I'm going to run out of fuel, I'm going to run out of fuel. But it kept going. And it ran out of fuel on the last lap um, after I'd passed the uh, checkered flag coming out of Beckett's. And the engine, apparently, uh, the pistons had, had meltdown. I mean, the engine was junk. But we won the race. And the 120,000 crowd went absolutely, absolutely wild. Absolutely yeah. Invaded the crowd, that surrounded great. you. That must be a great feel-good But, I mean, factor. what a race for them. I mean, 25 laps down with... 22 laps to go, and then and then the overtaking manoeuvre as well down the straight was uh, was pretty good. Go! And a superb PK blasts away. Prost comes up right alongside Mansell, and Prost leads into Cops. An absolutely meteoric start from the Frenchman. That is something that we're not used to seeing. The Williams Hondas usually get away very quick, but already Prost has lost the lead. And it's PK leading, Mansell coming through to take second position away from Prost, with Senna in fourth place. Nigel Mansell is coming in at the end of the 35th lap to change tyres. And it's going to be critical, his time compared with that of Nelson Piquet, if the Brazilian subsequently decides to stop for tyres. Prost's stop was 8.1 seconds. He's the main contender who's been in. 
fronts on very quickly indeed. Mansell goes through and it's now 12.8 seconds. So PK has got the message and has speeded up a bit, but he is on warm rubber and there is absolutely no doubt now that if PK opts to come in desperately to get new tyres, he has lost the race. He's got to stay out. And the gap between PK and Mansell now is 3.9 seconds. It's less. Look. Savour this. This is a great British Grand Prix. And this is where Mansell will be looking to challenge. PK will hold the inside line. And, oh! and Mansell's through. And a tremendous drive by Nigel, but that really was a bad mistake by PK to go back to the other side of the track. He just opened the door again. Nigel Mansell can see the chequered flag. Out he goes. Mansell has won the British Grand Prix. Nelson Piquet finishes in second place. The British enthusiasm for Grand Prix racing has never shown more. Nigel is not going to be allowed to get back to his pit. Amazing. And what a an absolutely incredible drive. We've always known that Nigel Mansell had enough guts, grit and determination for any 10 men. He has shown that more than ever before. You were driving with crowd power as well as horsepower. That's Did you know what the crowd was? I'll tell you that's true because uh, as soon as I knew I was catching Nelson, the crowd all around the circuit, I think for the last 15 laps, I mean, they were waving to me on all the corners, down the straights. I mean, it was willing me on. I mean, it helped tremendously. I mean, I've got to thank them for the win because uh, it definitely put five seconds in my pocket. Now, Austria, the Grand Prix at the Österreich Ring in 1987, was quite incredible. A Grand Prix that had three separate starts. Well, we had a lot of opposition there, so I thought, uh, you know, we'd get away <laughs> to some slow starts and cause havoc. <laughs> we had a problem with the clutch, and I think there was about a 12-car pile. It was Martin Brundle that caused a <laughs> problem in the first one. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Well, he, thank you, Martin. He, he, uh, <laughs> he uh, crashed and stopped the race behind you. Right. But then you had clutch drag on the second start. 52 laps, and PK scorches away. Mansell is left. Very badly indeed. Look how he's being passed. And there's another coming together. A car dragging along the arm code. Two, three of them out. And one of them is Stefan Johansson. And there's a Ferrari down there. And they're all over the circuit. This is far worse than the first one. And what about the third start? Away you third go. start, we got away clean, thank goodness. And, uh, you know, I, I went very steady for the opening laps and then sort of... Uh, sort of put on the pressure a little bit more. When the race finally got underway, the Williams drivers resumed their duel. PK's good. Berger is ahead of Mansell. Boots is ahead of Mansell. So the opportunity is all with Nigel Mansell if there are any delays caused by the back markers. And Nakajima going quite slowly through that corner. And the track is blocked ahead of Nelson PK, who's just pulling in behind Nakajima as Mansell comes alongside him. And Mansell's got the line for the corner, so just the break that Nigel was looking for. Nigel Mansell crosses the line in his 100th Grand Prix, leading it very commandingly indeed. And here he is, completing the 52nd and last lap of the Austrian Grand Prix. The flags are waving. The Union Jack, the Japanese flag, goes out from the Honda pit. Very special win because we don't race in Austria anymore, so to, to win there was, uh, was precious. And all this was in spite of the fact that you had a failing clutch. Well, the clutch wasn't, wasn't good. We, we had, uh, the clutch was slipping a little bit at the end, but I think the thing that I have s fond memories about was, was after the race almost having my head taken off with a steel girder in the, uh, in the course car coming to speak to you and then you just poking me on the head. <laughs> and I mean, I, don't, I think, do you remember Nigel, that? you've got that awful yeah. bump on yeah, your well, head. No. <laughs> Push my finger straight into it. Yes, no, I, rem I remember I was, having a headache uh, for a few days. I was hoping right. you weren't going to mention <laughs> that, actually. By the time of the Spanish Grand Prix, Nigel needed a win to keep his championship hopes alive. Benner sprints up into third position behind the two Williams and ahead of both the Ferraris. 
It's a clean start round the first corner. That's a blessing. And it's P.K. Mansell, Senna, the two cars from Didcot, the Williams factory. Mansell leading, P.K. second. And Mansell into the pit. Now, this is a vital pit stop. Nigel Mansell leading the Spanish Grand Prix on lap 43 into the pit. Is this a good one? The seconds are ticking by. I wish we could have a look and clear the crowd. It's not very good. 11.3 seconds. Nigel Mansell on lap 43. Very surprising that he's come in that late. But that is El Piquet. They're out together. Now Mansell's got the advantage because he's in front. Piquet lost any chance of challenging his teammate by forgetting to hold his foot on the brake pedal during his tyre stop, which cost him 11 seconds. The Brazilian later compounded his error by spinning. My goodness, PK under pressure has done what he did in Hungary last year, spun badly, regained the course. Mansell's 12th Grand Prix victory closed the points gap to PK, who could only manage a fourth place finish. Nigel Mansell has won the Spanish Grand Prix. Nigel's pole position was his 15th consecutive front row grid position. But too much wheel spin at the start let Bootsen and Berger past. Piquet's erratic form continued when he spun and stalled on the first lap. The Brazilian was push started and rejoined at the tail of the field. That is not what a healthy Ferrari is meant to look, look like and it looks like a big one's about to happen. When Berger's Ferrari blew up on lap 21, Mansell took the lead. Ten laps later, the race was stopped after Derek Warwick crashed into the tyre wall. The race will be restarted and the, the decision as regards the winner will be on aggregate times of the two portions of the race. At the restart, Piquet grabbed the lead, needing to win by 45 seconds to take overall victory. And Piquet, of course, will be desperately trying to get ahead of Mansell and then break away, and he's done it! He's done it! Frank Williams himself admitted the other day that he had tried desperately to dampen the fire that smouldered between the Brazilian and the Englishman, and Mansell challenges and comes right up alongside Piquet and at the critical moment takes the apex of the bend and loses it again. At the finish, Mansell was 26 seconds behind Piquet, but it was enough to give him victory on aggregate. There's the flag. Sadly, Nigel's championship hopes were ended in the first qualifying session at the Japanese Grand Prix. Piquet won the driver's title, but both he and Honda severed their links with the Williams team at the end of 1987. 1988 was a difficult year for Williams and Mansell. It was the first season since they had joined forces in which there were no Grand Prix wins. For 1989, Mansell fulfilled the dream of every Formula One driver by joining Ferrari with the new teammate Gerhard Berger. to the new partnership 
far sooner than anyone expected. Brazil, Nigel, your seventh choice, 1989. Um, very precious, yeah. very, very precious. My first race for Ferrari um, to, to win first time out. Um, I'm only the second driver in the history of Ferrari to actually achieve that. So, I mean, uh, it was great. Yes, but am I not right in saying that you doubted whether the car would last <laughs> a, few, a few laps no, even after it, all the trouble you'd had in practice? If you were to take the senses of opinion up and down the pit lane, you wouldn't have got anybody to put the car lasting past five laps. And I must confess that even I booked my ticket home uh, <laughs> early, uh, halfway through the race. And, uh, you know, the car just kept on working, kept on going. And, um, you know, it was absolutely marvellous. And away they go. Now, Berger trying to come through, but Patrese is taking the lead. Is he? No, Senna's holding it. And Berger is trying to sprint through on the inside of the automatic gearbox Ferrari. And Patrese goes through. Berger spins and has lost part of the car. Senna is being passed. By lap four, Nigel was in second place and catching the race leader. Russell's taking the lead. And that's... Nigel Mansell went round the outside. The lead was lost with a slow tyre stop on lap 21, but the Ferrari was back in front just seven laps later. His tyre stop dropped him back behind Alain Prost, and so Mansell takes the lead for the second time at the Brazilian Grand Prix. And I also remember saying in the commentary that it was the first time I'd ever seen a driver come into the pits and change five wheels. Five wheels, that's right. Yeah, but even the steering wheel was starting to come off in my hands. Yeah, the bolts started to come loose and the whole wheel was moving in the car and uh, we had to come in and change the steering wheel as well. And there is Nigel Mansell in the pits. He had the steering wheel off for some reason. What on earth is happening? He's having a new steering wheel ready. And he's ready to, and he's left, left the pits. On the 47th lap, Mansell took the lead for the third and final time. Mansell can sling the shot out of Slipstream, which he's doing now at the end of the straight, going into the curve of Sol at 150 miles an hour. When Nigel crossed the finish line to win a Grand Prix for the 14th time, the team and driver could scarcely believe their luck. But Nigel Mansell has won the Brazilian Grand Prix. You were a bit of an unknown quantity in uh, Italy in terms of presence, personality and the other vital attributes of a Grand Prix driver, but now you were their hero, weren't you? Well, I mean, I think that's for other people to judge, but I know that I have a great following in Italy and uh, they have a, a very warm affection for me and I'd like to think that I reciprocate that. But yes, in one word, uh, I mean, uh, we get on very well. Reliability problems, mainly with the Ferrari's new semi-automatic gearbox, resulted in a string of non-finishes in the races following Brazil. But from mid-season, things began to improve. Your next choice is the Hungarian Grand Prix, another victory, a quite incredible one, Nigel, because you started 12th on the grid. Yeah, I think this is one of the, uh, the better wins because, I mean, no one ever thought that in a place like Hungary, that you could actually win that far back on the grid. And because it's so difficult to pass. It's so, so difficult to pass, but we had problems with understeer and uh, Maurizio and I done my engineer there at Ferrari and I uh, went into a big discussion Saturday evening and made some different front uh, flaps for the uh, front wings uh -huh. overnight. And we transformed the car and made the car basically about a second and a half a lap quicker on the Sunday than it was on the Saturday for qualifying. So for the race, obviously I was very, very optimistic. In the warm-up, I was the quickest. But the problem was I was 12th and not on the front. So, I mean, I'd sort of pumped myself up for that start more than any other start in Grand Prix racing. And I passed, I think it was seven cars on the first lap. And I got myself literally into, uh, I think it was about sixth place, fifth or sixth place. And then I just had to sit and wait and be patient because it was impossible to pass. But then ultimately, uh, you know, it paid off and we pushed and pushed and uh, I got myself to a situation then I was running first and second with Ayrton Senna and then we came up on some back markers and then, uh, you know, we were very opportunists uh, with Stefan Johansson, if you remember, in the money trend, uh, 
then uh, Ayrton uh, got a little bit blocked and literally I pulled straight out, blocked him in and went past and that was it. Yeah, and I can tell you that it was absolutely incredible to watch. Surely that move was just pure instinct. Yeah, I mean, you can't plan things like that. You've got to be ready. You've got to, what you've got to do, you, you've got to plan to be in a position to take the, the opportunistic uh, thing happening when it happens. Because if you're sort of 10 feet too far behind, you can see it happening, but you're not close enough. Yeah. And what I did was plan to be right there and I could see it happening and visualizing that just maybe he might get this a bit wrong. And he did, and uh, I was there to take full advantage of it. And, and I'll tell you, I did. <laughs> and it's a good start by Patrese. And up alongside him comes Cathy Ayrton. Senna is going through on the inside. It looks to me as though he's going to take the lead, but no. Patrese holds him. Senna is in second. Up comes one of the Ferraris. Mansell outpowered him on the other, the second longest straight on the circuit, nipped across the Vanderbilt. Now, Martin Brundle there. In his Brabham Judd, he will see this battle for the lead bearing down on him, and he will see Mansell going through and taking third position from Alain Post. Here, Jonathan Palmer going into the pits, and Senna goes for it. He goes through. Ayrton Senna takes the lead on the 52nd lap of the Hungarian Grand Prix. Patrese was just slightly off his mark there. And now Mansell is going to do the same thing. No, he's not. He has to hang back. Crosses his way through, Patrese has lost two places in almost the time he takes to save. Now, can he do the same thing to Ayrton Senna? And Mansell goes through! Oh, fantastic! Nigel Mansell, as he and Senna come up to pass the Onyx, takes the lead. Now, is he going to pull away? And a superb win for Nigel Mansell and Ferrari. For 1990, Nigel had a new teammate at Ferrari, three times world champion Alain Prost. As the season progressed, Mansell seemed to be having all the team's bad luck. After failing to finish in the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, the frustration came to a head, and Nigel announced that he would be retiring from racing at the end of the season. It does make me very sad, but uh, I'm announcing my retirement today. Round 13 of the 1990 World Championship at Estoril saw Nigel's luck change. At the start, excessive wheel spin caused Mansell's Ferrari to slide across the track into teammate Prost. The McLarens of Senna and Berger went through into first and second places. And off goes Mansell, through goes Prost. And so Prost is now up into third position, down to fourth place. Does that mean to say that Nigel Mansell's tyres are worn? Nigel was the first of the leading cars to stop for new tyres. <laughs> On the 50th lap, Mansell moved the Ferrari past Senna and into the lead. He's closer than ever, and I think Senna missed a gear coming onto the straight. Senna seemed to miss a gear. Mansell going, going for it, and Mansell is through. Nigel was fortunate to escape without damage from a collision with Alio on lap 54. And look at this lot, as it's Gutelman, the two Ligiers of Larini and Alio on the left, Pierre Luigi Martini in the yellow Minardi. Here is race leader Nigel Mansell. He comes up alongside and takes, does he? Alio, they clip each other. Mansell, he seems to be unharmed and is in the lead still. Seven laps later, the race was stopped when Alex Caffey crashed heavily and Mansell was declared the winner. Following intensive negotiations, Nigel reversed his decision to retire from racing and rejoined Williams for 1991 to race alongside Riccardo Patrese.
Williams team's decision to speed development of its semi-automatic gearbox by racing with it from the start of the season was at the cost of results in the opening rounds of the 1991 championship. Four wins in the first four races by Senna left Mansell with a mountain to climb if he was to win the driver's title. Nigel scored his first points of the year in Monaco and at the French Grand Prix he began to make serious inroads into Senna's championship lead. Watch the lights. And this is the critical time, and it's go! And a beautiful start, and Patrese has blown it again. Prost leads, Mansell up into second place. Ayrton Senna in third position, Berger is in fourth place, Alesi is fifth, and Ricardo Patrese is right down position. When Prost was impeded by De Cesaris, Mansell pounced, taking the lead. And Mansell challenging for the lead, and, and Prost moves over, and Nigel Mansell leads the French Grand Prix on lap 22. He has closed from 2.5 seconds to leadership. Terrific! Prost goes through, he leads, and Alain Prost re-leads the French Grand Prix as Nigel Mansell rejoins after 10 and a half seconds. Nigel Mansell right with Alain Prost and you can see for yourself how close they are as they come through to complete lap 54 and you can see one, two, three, four cars ahead of them that they will shortly catch and this could be Nigel Mansell's golden opportunity to get past Alain Prost if the Frenchman fumbles the traffic. Yes, and this is fine driving by Mansell. He can see the cars in front and he's getting himself into position and... Uh, Making Prost, I'm sure, feel very uncomfortable. The Mantle's trying to get around the outside. He's got a oh, he's got him, got in front of Prost around the outside. Now that is something else, something else. Sensational stuff from Mantle. The outbreak, Alan Prost round the outside and just put yourself across his bars. His great skill. It's also pretty brave. And Nigel Mantle wins the French Grand Prix at the Nevers Circuit at Manicourt. And Renault have won in France. Nigel's 17th Grand Prix victory made him the most successful English Grand Prix driver in history. A week after the victory in France, Nigel did it again. In front of a massive and enthusiastic home crowd, Mansell beat his rivals hands down. Watch the lights then, 59 laps of the British Grand Prix are about to begin. That's it! And Senna gets ahead of Nigel Mansell, and a spin at the back from Bertrand Gasho has spun the door, but Senna leads into Cox. Nigel Mansell is second after a searing start from the Brazilian, and Ricardo Patrese has spun. Well, two spinners, even before the competitors have done half a lap, and you can see already that Ayrton Senna and Nigel Mansell are pulling away from one of the Benettons. Yes, and the start has certainly held the red, the path of the red a long time, as Mansell makes a dive inside Senna, and he's taking the lead. So Mansell in the lead already. After just two laps, Nigel had a lead of over four seconds. Nigel Mansell wins the British Grand Prix for the third time in his career. You don't need me to tell you how happy he is. Senna's last lap retirement with dry fuel tanks brought about the photo opportunity of the year when Nigel gave the Brazilian a lift back to the pits after the race. Well, you were certainly the pre-race favourite here. All the crowd were backing you. How does it feel now to have actually done it here in front of the British crowd at Silverstone? Well, it's strange, but I probably don't believe it. I mean, the crowd are just incredible, aren't they? I mean, my heart goes out to them. I thank them very much for the support. It is absolutely fantastic. It feels great, honestly. <laughs> At Hockenheim, Nigel sprinted away from pole position to lead the race for all but the two laps following his tire stop. And Mansell 
Hall's got a flyer. And Berger passes Senna. Gerhard Berger goes up into second place. Senna goes down to third. And Nigel into the pits right now. He leads by 17 seconds. Is he going to be able to get out quickly enough to be able to retain the lead? I very much doubt it. You can see the seconds ticking away. You're watching the action. Patrese has gone through. He's in the lead. And through has gone Alacy, who is in second place as Mansell sprints out. So Mansell rejoins the race in third place. By the 20th lap, Mansell had retaken the lead and went on to score the first hat-trick of Grand Prix wins in his career. And Prost is, as we predicted, mounting a late charge to try and wrest it away from Adam Senna. Senna again. Oh, and Prost tried down the outside. Oh! And uh, Senna forces the mistake. And it looks like Prost has stalled his car up and has got out. When Senna again ran out of fuel on the final lap, the Brazilian's championship lead over Mansell was cut to just eight points. Nigel Mansell, Red 5, is on his way to his 19th Grand Prix win. He took the English greatest ever driver lead from Sterling Moss when he won his 17th Grand Prix. Then he won two weeks ago in Britain and now he wins here in Germany. Nigel Mansell wins the German Grand Prix, his third Grand Prix in succession. The Italian Grand Prix of 1991. What was special about that for you? Winning in Italy. Uh, winning not only in Italy, because I'd done that at Imola, but winning at Monza. The uh, Tifosi at Monza are just something special. And uh, it's close to winning a British Grand Prix. And uh, it was just so rewarding to, uh, to win that day. Now, I'll tell you something, Nigel. I go to the Italian races, San Marino and Monza, and I see Italians wrapped in the Union Jack with Il Leone, Nigel Mansell on it. Does the strength of their feeling and admiration for you surprise you? Well, I mean, I mean, only they can say why, but, you know, if someone captures their imagination, um, and in my particular instance, I guess I've captured their imagination with my driving, um, then, then they'll support you till the cows come home. Do you feed on that? Do you enjoy it? Oh, I do feed on it, yes. I mean, this last race this year, I mean, I went to uh, a Ferrari um, supporters club and uh, they presented me with a gold watch and they didn't stop applauding from the minute I arrived to the minute I left and that was 40 minutes later. And <laughs> they were just ecstatic. At, I mean, what can you say except... But they, 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 they're so knowledgeable about their racing and uh, they just like pure racers, hence the, the great uh, support that Gilles had. Yeah, and, yeah. Nigel, you paid them the compliment, which all too few British drivers do, of learning some of their language and talking to them in Italian. Well, I did my best. I mean, uh, we could certainly have a uh, normal day conversation, but um, technical conversation, engineering conversation was a problem. But uh, they are great, very exciting people. This is the critical time. Senna's made a perfect start. Mansell slots in second. Berger is third. Patrese is in fourth position. Martini is trying to come up on the outside. But into the retifilio, it is Senna, Mansell, Berger, Patrese. Now, is this going to be Mansell's chance? And he's waving Patrese. Is he waving Patrese through? Yes, he is. He is. He saw Nigel Mansell's hand come out of the cockpit. And does this mean that Mansell has a problem? I can't see him willingly let Patrese through unless he has. It may be that Patrese has a little bit of a different setup in his car. Patrese's going for it now. Yes, that's the closest he's been out of the Lesmo. Patrese, he's right in the toe. This is a chance. And he's inside. Patrese takes the lead. And now Nigel Mansell is going to have a go. Because you can see that... Ricardo Patrese is pulling away now, and if Nigel Mansell can get past Ayrton Senna, he will be able to do the same thing. I have little doubt that his Renault V10 engine will have just the same horsepower as Patrese's, and then Ayrton Senna would have a major problem, because Mansell could get past Patrese on orders or on merit, and that would mean that the gap... Oh, that's Patrese spinning! But Patrese has spun out down to third position. 
up to the Ascari, Benz and Nanta Mansell, is he going through and taking the lead on this occasion? Yes, he is. Mansell leads in Italy into the Parabolica for the last time. When he gets out of it, he really could put the car into neutral and coast home. And I'm going to say that Nigel Mansell has won the Italian Grand Prix. He thinks so. He's waving his hand. He has. Mansell wins and takes the 10 points that goes with it. The win in Italy kept Nigel's championship hopes alive. But a botched wheel change in Portugal was a major setback. In Spain, only a win would suffice for Nigel. Berger gets away well. Senna is coming up alongside Nigel Mansell and going through. So, S Senna is ahead of the man he needs to be ahead of. Is Berger going to let him through into the lead at turn one? No, he is not. Berger leads. Senna second. And in third position, Nigel Mansell. Fourth is Michael Schumacher. Up from fifth and then the two Ferraris. And it looks to me as though they've all got round the first series of Benz safely. Indeed they have. And Senna is exactly where he wants to be ahead of his main rival in the championship. And there are Senna and Mansell. They have missed the pit entrance. And I'm very surprised that Senna hasn't come for tyres now. He's got Mansell throwing all over him. He has no reason to stay out. I think the tactic should have been for Senna to go for tyres. It's going to be too late. Wheel to wheel stuff. Look at this. They're almost touching. Mansell gets in there. And Senna back on the inside. Yes, and I'm sure Senna's coming this time. The McLaren crew are ready again with tyres. I'm looking at Williams are also ready and it may well be they'll come in together. It looks, they are. And so the two leaders coming together, and this is dramatic because their pits are right next to each other, and that makes for difficulties, particularly on the exit. Now, they're in the right order to go in okay, because Mansell's ahead. But this is a wheel-changing race, and I'm sure Williams will be conservative. And Senna's ready to go, and they're way ahead, and well ahead of the Williams. And Senna, with quite a big advantage, goes out in the lead. The meantime, and right, that's Senna spinning! Senna spins, and he's nearly collected! Wow! Oh, and, and he's on the he's on the gravel! And look at this, Nigel Mansell inching up on Gerhard Berger, the lead-up. Ayrton Senna is back in the points in sixth position, ahead of Alessi, who is seventh. Is this where the lead is going to take change? Yes! Yes! And Mansell and Berger sit it out just as Senna and Mansell sat it out earlier. And this time, Gerhard Berger is the leader. Yes, and Schumacher is still getting steadily closer. Still the quickest man on the circuit at the moment, Michael Schumacher. In third place, as Mansell goes to the inside. And wheel-to-wheel -wheel stuff, but Mansell got it. And uh, Berger really seemed to hang on to that one for a long time. May have been... Uh, Lost a bit less time if he'd let it go. But Mansell takes the lead and Schumacher is right with them. And out goes the checkered flag and Nigel Mansell wins in Spain. Magnificent. With Senna trailing home in fifth place, the win, Nigel's 21st, gave the Englishman an outside chance of winning the driver's title. But as in 1987, the Japanese Grand Prix would see the end of another world championship bid by Mansell. 1992 would be a very different story. We're back in South Africa then for your 10th choice, Kyle Army. Now the last time you'd won there in 1985, it was on the old circuit. The new one had been completely revamped. What did you think of it? I think it was um, pretty challenging. Um, very demanding, very grueling from the point of view of uh, not having any time to sort of breathe properly because needless to say uh, at over 7,000 feet altitude, very hot, um, you probably had about two or three seconds per lap where you could actually breathe properly down the straight and then you're into another corner. But in terms of uh, drivability and uh, does a driver actually like it? I think it's fantastic. The most fantastic corner there is Sunset. Sunset flat out in sixth gear going into Ford Corner. At the end of 1991, you had said 
after the development we've done this year, we've got the car right, we're going to be very, very hard to beat in 1992. And in South Africa, that first race, you were fastest in all five of the practice sessions. You started in pole position and you dominated the race every inch of the way. You were certainly proved right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I said that, uh, you know, my aim was to sort of, you know, no surrender and no prisoners, just go out and get the job done. And that's exactly, I mean, I've been so focused. Um, I've even caught myself when people have been talking to me at times. Uh, and sometimes it's been quite important things I've been trying to get across. Although they've been standing there, I haven't been listening because I've just been concentrating on what I'm having to do myself to achieve my goal, which was to become the 1992 world champion. That was the first race with active suspension, which you'd worked on so hard. Yeah. Uh, what were your reactions to that? Well, I mean, there was a few teething problems, but I mean, ultimately we got the car sorted so well. I was very, very pleased with the winter testing. I think the test that broke the back and showed us the way was uh, the seven-day test we did at Estoril. We stayed on there for some extra days and uh, I think that test was the most valuable test that Williams have done probably in the last four or five years. And it's go and Mansell's got away extremely well as they go up to the first right-hander. And sure enough, it's that McLaren has dropped right back and up to the first left-hander, that is turn four, it's McClay Mansell in the lead. Yeah, and Nigel Mansell's in a very commanding position now because his teammates can, not deliberately, but uh, make it very difficult for Ayrton Senna to get past. And now we're riding with Nigel Mansell. Mansell leading now by eight, over eight and a half seconds and uh, really very comfortable indeed for him. And now Nigel Mansell is on his last lap you are looking at the potentially victorious Englishman almost home for the 22nd Grand Prix victory of his career. But far more importantly for him, 10 points in the 1992 World Championship and the Union Jacks are flying all round this Kyle Army circuit. Having dominated practice, having dominated the race, having put up the fastest lap in South Africa. He won in 1985. This is going to be a glorious back-to-back -back double, albeit separated by seven years. Well, he's done everything right today. No mistakes from Nigel Mansell. A marvellous drive. It's been easy, but he's handled it perfectly professionally. Tremendous win and a great start to 1992. And Mansell crosses the line, waves to the crowd. In Mexico City, another dominant performance, Nigel took pole position and led every lap of the race. Mansell's got away beautifully. Patrese is in second place, and, and there's a coming together right in the middle of the grid. That's Capelli going off in the Ferrari for 20th place on the grid. And the other one, I think, was Carl Wendlinger, the Austrian in the march. But it is Mansell leading, Patrese second, Senna is up into third place. And there is Senna putting off the circuit. Uh, we saw nothing wrong with his car just a moment ago. I wonder if uh, he's decided that he's not going to make the distance in the race. He's into that last swinging series of ten bends, each of which is faster than the one that he's just left. And when he clears the last one, it'll be the run down the 180 mile an hour straight to the Peraltada. Out to the Peraltada to see the chequered flag. To see 10 points, and he's now approaching the Peraltada, down the last straight, the speed building. This is the Peraltada, look for the chequered flag. Mansell is certainly doing so. There it is. Nigel Mansell wins in Mexico. Despite a nasty accident in qualifying, Nigel scored a third overwhelming win in Brazil. It's go. Now, who's going to get away first from the Williams? It's a magnificent start by Ricardo Patrese, who leads Nigel Mansell away. Patrese's been practicing his starts and it seems to have been working. Schumacher is in third place. Look at this colossal gaggle as they go through the S's. Ricardo Patrese, Williams, Renault. Nigel Mansell in second place. Then it's Ayrton Senna tight up behind him. It's John Alesi. 
Now it's Schumacher, then it's Alesi, then it's Martin Brundle, then it's Pierluigi Martini. And Mansell had a big go down the inside of Patrese there. The two Williams now are already in a race of their own. As Ayrton Senna coming into the pits. Now, is this an early tyre stop? It is not. Ayrton Senna is retiring from his own Brazilian Grand Prix. Patrese led until the tyre stops, after which Mansell took charge to complete a second career hat-trick. And Mansell rejoins the race after an 8.54 stop. Patrese will be next. Ricardo Patrese sprints out of the pits and Nigel Mansell leads the Brazilian Grand Prix. And there he is, that's how close it was, just half a second between them and the pit stop as the Williams team look for their team leader and that he is, Nigel Mansell crosses the line now to win the Brazilian Grand Prix. In the rain at Barcelona, Nigel encountered strong opposition from the Benetton of young German ace Michael Schumacher. Jean Alesi found grip at the start and made a phenomenal getaway. First Patrese and then Senna retired. As Mansell pulled away into the lead, the challenge was taken up by Schumacher, who managed to reduce Nigel's lead from 21 seconds to just five late in the race, before the Williams driver sprinted away to reopen a gap of 16 seconds in just five laps. At the finish, Nigel was 24 seconds ahead as he won for the fourth time in a row. At Imola, Nigel made Formula One history when he became the first driver ever to win the opening five races of the season. They've all got away well at the front. Mansell leads, Patrese is second, Senna coming up alongside the Italian as they go round the Tamburello and it's still Mansell leading. Patrese second, Senna third, Schumacher fourth, Berger fifth, Martin Brundle is in sixth position. And already the Williams is storming away. And that really is a most impressive first lap from Mansell and Patrese. Mansell into the pits. Now, I wonder how long Nigel Mansell will take for his pit stop compared with that of Ricardo Patrese. He's got plenty of time to just take it nice and easy. Remember what happened in Portugal when last year Nigel Mansell lost the race because of a faulty tyre stop. That's a long stop, nine seconds. But Ricardo Patrese is coming through to complete the lap and the gap between them now is four and a half seconds. They're both on fresh rubber and Mansell crosses the line for williams Renault to win the San Marino Grand Prix very convincingly indeed. Following the disappointments in Monaco and Canada, the French Grand Prix saw Nigel re-establish himself as the pacemaker in Formula One. And out sprints Michael Schumacher and Patrese noses ahead of Nigel Mansell. Now Patrese, who took pole position last year, has got a real flyer. Patrese leads, this is the exact opposite of Canada. Patrese, Mansell, then the two McLarens, the two Benettons, the two Ferraris as they come up to the underneath hairpin and there's a contact there, who is it? It's Schumacher, and who is he hit? It's one of them, it's Senna! And now they're dropping their way round, are they going to stop the race? In part one of a rain-affected race, Ricardo Patrese didn't make it easy for his teammates. Mansell is really going for it, trying on the outside this time, but Patrese doesn't give way there alongside. Surely Mansell will take the lead here. They're coming up to the Nürburgring here, the right and the left. And Mansell is in the passing position, but Patrese forces him back. Well, this is a terrific scrap between two equally determined teammates in two perfectly matched williams Renaults. So the French Grand Prix is stopped on lap 20 out of 72. After the restart, Nigel took control. Again, Mansell attacks, and again he's through. Nigel Mansell leads, and now he's fairly streaking away. The rain returned in the closing laps, but Nigel swept to his sixth win in eight races.
If there is one race in all the races that you have dominated in your career, it's the British Grand Prix. It was your fourth win in 1992. It was at Silverstone. It was your fifth in Britain. And you were on pole by two seconds. Uh, how can you be that much ahead of everybody else? People power. What do you mean People by that? People power. Well, I'd rather keep that to myself because, I mean, unless you ever get into that position, no one can ever dream what that means. Um, the supporters, the fans, the people that come to Silverstone, they know what that means and that's all that matters to me. We can dig, and even Sterling Marston and some other great drivers have said, at Silverstone, I'm unbeatable, I can delve into the depths of whatever they think I can delve into. And all I would say to them is they're not wrong. I mean, I think I've demonstrated with the five wins I've had in England and certainly the last three that I've had at Silverstone, uh, you know, we can dominate there and uh, it is just a fantastic place. It's in my home country. The fans are just, well, they are second to none. They are marvellous. And of course, my last choice, the 11th choice, has got to be the British Grand Prix of 1992. The British Grand Prix of 1992 is go! And Mansell's Patrese, who is now being attacked by Martin Brundle. As we ride with Nigel Mansell, you see his helmet just on the left-hand side. That is Beckett's corner. Now into those four and a half G corners. The right, left, right, left at Beckett's itself. Round Chapel Curve doing about 150 miles an hour down the fastest part of the course. Well, equal fastest. He's doing 190 miles an hour here as he goes into Stowe Corner. Nigel Mansell leading by 39 seconds, completing his 29th lap in this 59 lap race. He more or less coasts in. Now, I say again, with a lead like he's got, what they need to make sure is those wheel nuts are done up tight because he's had problems with them in the past. Nigel Mansell emerges still in the lead with an, after an 11.7 seconds stop and he will go through before Ricardo Patrese passes the start and finish line. And Senna stops! Ayrton Senna is retiring from yet another Grand Prix. The Union Jacks are waving and Nigel Mansell wins the 1992 British Grand Prix in terrific style. Hands off the wheel. And you can see how happy Nigel Mansell is. An excess of wheel spin allowed Patrese to lead at the first corner. Ricardo Patrese has got another flyer and leads into the first corner. But Mansell was through into the lead by the end of the opening lap. Nigel's tyre stop on lap 14 dropped him behind Patrese and Senna. A fraught moment at the Oz curve chicane saw Mansell doing a bit of rally cross as he fought his way past Senna and into second place on lap 19. When Patrese had a tyre stop, Nigel was back in his customary first place. Coming into the last corner of the last lap, Nigel Mansell wins in Germany and he equals Ayrton Senna's record. Nigel's eighth win of 1992 put the Drivers' Championship almost beyond doubt. At the Hungarian Grand Prix, second place was enough to clinch the World Drivers' Championship. Nigel Mansell had finally fulfilled his dream. And it's go. Mansell kicks it sideways. Gets away well. Senna trying to get up on the right. But Berger is already up into third position ahead of his teammate. It's, it's Mansell leading. Patrese second. Senna taking third place from Gerhard Berger and challenging Patrese. Now, where is Mansell? Here he is. He is into the pits. Now, remember what happened to Ricardo Patrese. The Williams team made a mess of it. They will be very conscious of this. They will be conscious, or should be, of the fact that they really can take their time. It was that right rear last year that caused the problem. They'll be on tenter hooks this time. Well, that was nothing to write home about, but 9.45 seconds has at least got Nigel Mansell back into the race on four wheels. Mansell wins the Portuguese Grand Prix and a record ninth win in one season. At the finish, 
Mansell was 39 seconds ahead of Berger, who had earlier been involved in a frightening incident with Patrese. Nigel's victory at Estoril set a new record for wins in a single season and made him the third most successful Grand Prix driver in history, with 30 wins. You've broken so many records in 1992, Nigel. Uh, the most races by a British driver, uh, the most wins by a British driver. How much does that matter to you? Well, it's a tremendous, but I mean, as Jackie Stewart said, when he set his record, he didn't really appreciate it would stand for as many years as it has. I just hope that uh, if I'm fortunate that my record stands for as many years as he had his, then I'll be very grateful. But, um, you know, standards uh, and records are set to be beaten. <laughs> and I feel sure in one day there'll be another driver come along and, uh, and, and beat my records. Precious few people are recognised by their nation and even fewer sportsmen. You have been recognised by being awarded the OBE, the Order of the British Empire. A very, very proud achievement. Very, very proud. Very, very precious. T t we don't know about this sort of thing. T tell, us, tell us just a little about what happens when you receive the award. Well, it's, it's so precious I'd rather not. Um, I think also from the point, fact of, of having the award, I was privileged enough to have lunch with the Queen for a few hours one day uh, on the one-to-one -one with sort of four or five other people present and uh, it was just phenomenal and uh, I think it just makes you so proud not only to be British and English uh, but to have achieved uh, a level in your own sport where you know you are uh, bestowed this fantastic honour. Well now sadly as far as we're concerned it's Nigel Mansell to Indy car racing in 1993 how do you look back on your long career in Formula One from 1980 to 1992? With uh, some fantastic fond memories, with a lot of pain. Um, obviously sitting here, two broken backs later, a broken neck later, broken wrist and smashed toes and various other ailments which I won't go into. I mean, we've, we've been through it. We've um, but I feel that we've come out on top, we've succeeded, our lifetime's ambition. There's many, many drivers and people that, that go into their selected sports and don't achieve the ultimate. I, at least in 1992, can say that we achieved the ultimate in pulling off the World Championship. So um, I think leave the sport with tremendous satisfaction, tremendous pride with the achievements and records that you've just mentioned that we've actually uh, achieved. with five Grand Prix wins straight off at the beginning of the year, never achieved in the history of the sport. Uh, you know, 30 wins now to date or whatever, and it's um, pretty, pretty uh, nice. And of course, the maximum points win in any year in the history of the sport also. That is very comforting. Well, all your fans, thousands and thousands and thousands of them all over the world, look back on your career with admiration and affection. And we look forward to your new career and wish you many, many more wins. And just in finishing, I'd, I'd like to dedicate my Formula One career to a few special people. Uh, I mean, ultimately, to my wife, Rosanne, because without her support from the very, very beginning, uh, I couldn't even be sitting here today speaking to you. But also, all the believers out there, and there's a lot of them, uh, but there's you know some few very special people, which I won't mention, but they know who I'm talking about. And then also, there's some... Oh, the extraordinary hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people out there that I dedicate my whole Formula One career to you, the fans. Enjoy this. Thank you very, very much for the support. 
and uh, incredible happiness you brought me. And I think I can share with you, as you can share with me, the happiness at the British Grand Prix, which perhaps people in the Formula One pit lane don't understand the affection we have. Thank you.